Good evening, y'all. Glad y'all are here. How are you guys doing tonight? All right. Not too bad. Not too bad. Um, if you haven't met, my name is uh, Larry, or you can call me Lawrence. Um, and it's it's so cool seeing you guys all here. Um, I love high school ministry because um, for a lot of you guys, you guys have the um, the freedom to kind of choose to be here. And the fact that a lot of you guys choose to be here on Sunday nights, you give um, a night every weekend to be here and to worship and to dive into God's word and to be with um, other believers. That's such a cool thing that um, that we get to do together. Um, it's also a really special thing that we have our volunteer leaders to help out as well. The really cool thing about that, um, believe it or not, that one point in their lives, they're also a high school student. Um, so they understand what it looks like to walk through um, the idea of maybe following Jesus um, at your age, or maybe at that point they weren't even following Jesus. Um, so it's cool that we get to all gather, we all get to open up God's word, worship, and just be here um, to do uh, to do life together. Um, before we get started, before we you know talk about God's word, I'm gonna go ahead and pray for us once again to kind of recenter our uh, our eyes on Jesus. Lord, God, we just thank you so much just for this day you've given us. God, thank you for breathing life into our bodies. And God, Lord, thank you that in you, God, there's just um, there's greater purpose. And thank you for our, our new identity in you. Um, God, we just pray for this time as we read your word and we, as we digest uh, what you have for us. God, I pray that we just see um, who you are, your, your heart for us. Um, yeah, God, we just thank you just for the cross, what you have done to make us right uh, before a holy and just God. Uh, thank you for the blood that was shed on our behalf. Um, we, just, we just thank you. Uh, we just pray for this time. May it be sweet and may it be fruitful. Um, we just give you all the glory uh, in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so if you're unfamiliar with um, the Bible or maybe the specific book of Esther, one thing that's interesting about Esther is it's a book um, that never actually mentions God. So you're kind of, you probably might be like thinking like, okay, why is it in the Bible um, if it doesn't really ever mention God? Well, the cool thing is like, though it doesn't dis- like explicitly say God did this and God did that, you see God working in the behind the scenes all throughout scripture. All right, it was written to encourage the Jews of this time as they're in hardship, um, that God is still present, that God is still near and God is still um, working. And the cool thing is, like, I think that looks a lot like our lives sometimes, right? That we don't always see God doing a miraculous and mighty work every single day, every single second of our lives. But just like the book of Esther, the reality is, even in our hardships and even when um, we might be walking through a hard situation, the reality is that God is still present. God is still God. And God is still on the throne. And he is still faithful. That He's faithful to us as we are walking through life. So pray as we're looking through Esther, looking at what is happening here, that we just see the heart of God in that, that he's um, a good God, and that as we walk through um, hardships, that he is um, faithful to us now. To kind of catch you guys up on what has been happening in the book of Esther, with this king who is a mighty king who has a lot of power and riches, but he's not a good king. In chapter one, we see uh, kind of his heart. And it opens up by this man, this king, uh, throwing this lavish party. Uh, in this party, all he cares about is just drinking and the women. And he asks his wife, the queen, to humiliate herself in front of all these men. So the queen refuses, and the king kicks her out and says, hey, we need a new, a new queen. So in that process, um, he, gets, he gathers these young, beautiful virgins, and he picks the one that he wants, and he picks Esther to be the new queen. And the reason why Esther becoming the new queen is uh, significant and why that's important is because Esther is a, she's a Jew. Um, She's a Jewish orphan that has now been put in this position of power. Um, And we see this um, clash of basically an identity crisis of like battling her beliefs and what she knows to be right. And now this power that she has as queen. But along with that, we see once again, God come through and God provide, but also see um, how through Esther's obedience, God do a mighty work through her and for God's people. So moving forward from some characters, I mean, some people in the story that we all know who we're talking about. Right? We have Esther, the Jewish queen. Uh, we have Mordecai, who's Esther's cousin, uh, who is, I guess, one of the one of the good guys. We like Mordecai, um, who helped raise her. And um, we have the king, who is, once again, the sinful king. We, um, he is um, not the best. And also in chapter 3, we want to introduce someone else, a new person named Haman. Um, so as we look at this, um, just consider 
what he, what Heyman is like, kind of compare me, compare and contrast him to the other characters and see just what he's like. So I'm going to read Esther chapter 2, verses 19 to 23. It says, Now when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not made known her kindred or her people, as Mordecai had commanded her. For Esther obeyed, as, as, for Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she brought up by him. Just as, wait, hold on, sorry. Just as when she was brought up by him. In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Big Thin and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the t- threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And this, king, and this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther. And Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows. It was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. So last week we talked about how Esther became a queen and how she was asked to keep her identity a secret. So she was asked to keep her Jewish identity a secret. And we see in the end of chapter 2 this, this dilemma unfold as Mordecai is sitting there at the king's gate. That he overhears these two eunuchs who are supposed to be loyal to the king come up with this plan to, uh, to end the king's life. In that moment, Mordecai could have done a lot of things. He could have just sat and listened. He could have intervened. He could have encouraged it. He could have done a lot of things. But what he chose to do, he, he heard what was happening, and went straight to Esther, went straight to the king, um, who told about what the plan was happening, what, plan, what, the, what the plan was um, to kill the king. And what's interesting is, like, all that we see from the king, he's not someone you would necessarily say is, like, worth saving, right? He hasn't done anything that's necessarily good, necessarily... Um, that we, we want him to stick around. But Mordecai, you see his heart, um, and we also see the bigger picture. Mordecai also sees the bigger picture of what's happening too. As Mordecai um, helps Esther, and as Esther is helping the king, the king's life is spared, um, that builds a level of trust between the king and Esther. Um, so um, their, their relationship is, 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 is building. But also understanding that if the king was killed, that kind of damages Esther and her relationship and with the king, and that also might hurt her as well. So we see this, this plan unfold. Um, and what's interesting is that, once again, Mordecai did a pretty good thing, right? He saved the king's life. And so you'll think that after you save the king's life that you might get something in reward. You might get a you know, special uh, acknowledgement, this special praise. But the chapter ends... With nothing like that, we don't see Mordecai get any special recognition. We don't see Mordecai um, get any kind of reward. Um, and if you look at it really face value, he didn't gain anything. And I think that's a small, small picture of maybe what it looks like to follow Jesus sometimes. Um, I think sometimes we've made following Jesus something that it isn't. That we, we like to categorize things as right or wrong. And you only, you'll only do it if you get something in return. That you'll um, choose to honor the Lord in front of certain people if they see and that you you, said, you, have this feel, you have this sense of accomplishment that you did something right. Um, but I think that's a little a little skewed, right? Our sense of accomplishment shouldn't come from the way people view us just because we did something right, but understanding that as we're making the right choices, the right choice is just the fact that we are honoring God with our choices. The, the fact is that we get to be obedient to God. And the reward is the fact that as we choose to be obedient to God, we get to see uh, the heart of God working in our lives as well, that we get to draw near to God. And that should become the reward, not the, not, not, not the, the praise that we get from you know, the person or the praise that we get from maybe someone in the church, but rather just understanding our, 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 our obedience to God is the reward. So my encouragement for us is like, as we're, do, as we're going through life and there's those opportunities before us to either make the right choice or make the wrong choice, let it be for the sole reason of just giving God the honor and glory with our lives and our actions and our thoughts rather than anything else. So going on to chapter 3, I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. It says, After these things, King Assyrus promoted Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day, he would not listen to them. He told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Azuras. 
So in chapter three, we see this, uh, this problem unfold once again, um, that we see Mordecai didn't gain anything, but we see this new guy come into the, to the picture. It was this guy, Haman, the Agagite. He was given the second in command. So he was given a lot of power. Um, and immediately he wants everyone to bow down before him and give him honor and glory and praise and all those things. So everyone in the kingdom does except for Mordecai. And what's interesting about that is like, not only is Mordecai facing a lot of social pressure of seeing everyone else bow down before this king or before this guy, it's also understanding like he's putting himself at risk by refusing to bow down to Haman. He's like, it's almost like a life or death kind of thing. It's interesting, like, well, you, you, it kind of brings up the question of, like, okay, why did Mordecai not bow down for Haman? Well, I think the, in the most simplest way possible to explain it, I think it's, roots, it's rooted in Mordecai's obedience to just God and the fact that he did not want to bow down to anyone else besides the one true God, um, and especially not Haman of all people. Um, a brief little history fact that the Agagites and the Israelites for a long time have had a long uh, dispute and so this beef that they've had for a long time. So, of course, obviously, Mordecai is not going to bow down to him of, of all people. So because of that, it kind of puts a big X on Mordecai, um, and Haman um, loses it, right? Like, not only was he a, a little upset, not only did he say uh, he's going to kill Mordecai, but his overreaction said he's going to kill every single Jewish person in the kingdom, which is a little extreme. Right? So once again, we see Haman in in. in who he really is, right? He's this power-hungry person who does anything he can to get um, the attention and the, and the praise and the glory that he thinks he deserves, right? I think it's, it's rooted in his own insecurity of, of desiring all these things from other people um, and what he'll do anything he can to get it. So just like Mordecai, I'm sure some of us have faced that problem before. We're walking through life, we're, you know, trying our best to be obedient to the Lord, um, and it comes to this moment of like, okay, am I going to bow to the things of this world or am I going to not? Am I going to choose to honor Jesus? Um, you might feel a little bit embarrassed. You might feel like the weird person. You might feel left out or you remain rooted, um, in, in Christ and decided to honor him. Or some of us, which might be harder to, um, admit is maybe sometimes we are more like Haman in a small way where our overreaction to something just causes a bigger problem where our lack of our self-control uh, results in something catastrophic. Or, or maybe in a small way, once again, like Haman, we're someone who all that we desire, all that we care about, is the way that people view us. That all we can do anything that we want to get the attention on us. It doesn't matter if it causes a problem. It doesn't matter if um, people dislike it or like it. That all that we care about is having the attention on us. Or I think whether you relate to Mordecai, relate to Haman, or maybe you just don't relate to either of them, right? I think regardless of that, I think all those things kind of comes down to just like understanding who God is to us, right? I think for each one of us, the way we kind of walk those um, hardships, the way that we kind of navigate those things is rooted in how well we understand um, our standing before God. If you're in Christ, that uh, you are, you're given a new identity, and you're now given this power to, 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 to fight against those temptations and things of this world, so as we're talking about this, my, my prayer for all of us is that um, if you're in the shoes of either Mordecai or you're this temptation about to things of the sword, or maybe like a person like Haman, that you stay rooted um, in Christ. I'm going to kind of summarize the rest of chapter 3. Um, as we see this plan that Haman is, is kind of scheming to um, kill all the Jews in the kingdom. And the way that Haman gets the king on board is by um, basically lying to the king saying, hey, these Jews are, they are um, they're causing a problem. And they are being disobedient. They're dangerous. And that they're a threat to the kingdom. And what's interesting is the king, he never like asks a question. He never says like, okay, like, can I, can I know more? He's like, all right, cool. Like, he, he, he believes Haman right then and there. He doesn't ask any questions to kind of get more information. And so it's interesting that we already know the king isn't the greatest guy. So I guess him, him, him giving the thumbs up to kill a bunch of Jews is like, all right, whatever. We also see that he's kind of a pushover, right? We see that Haman wants something, and the king just automatically gives it to him. And not only that, he gives Haman his signet ring, uh, which just shows the now kind of authority that Haman also has and the power to do just about anything that he wants. And it's interesting because this all happened because Mordecai refused to bow down to, to Haman, um, and, this, and the chapter ends with this, just this huge problem before us that now that all the Jewish people in this kingdom, are, are their lives are being threatened. The question is, did Mordecai ever really do anything wrong? 
right? I think the way it's portrayed in the scripture is kind of us understanding that, like, we shouldn't maybe second guess what Mordecai did and understand maybe it was the right thing. Um, and it still led to this problem where we see that we, they're facing this massive problem, that there's, their lives are being threatened just by the simple obedience of this one man, Mordecai. All throughout scripture, you actually see this problem kind of come out time and time again. That God's people face these hardships, face um, these situations where they're, they're asked to choose um, whether they'll obey God or fall to um, people and the, the forces of the world. And what's interesting is like, um, where I think sometimes we have this view that as, we, as, we war- as we're walking with Jesus, that's going to be this easy walk in the park. It's going to be a breeze. It's going to be super easy now that we're walking with the Lord. The reality is if you look all throughout scripture, once again, you see it's kind of the opposite, right? You see that there's going to be hardship. There's going to be people that we face that completely oppose the throne of God. And so what I want us to have an understanding of is that just because you're walking with Jesus, not automatically mean that your life is always going to be easy. But reality is the now that we are following with Jesus, we have the fullness of God and we can have abundant life as we as we are living in the fullness of God, um, and he will guide us and lead us through those hardships. We're going to go all the way back to the first book in the Bible, Genesis chapter 12, uh, where we kind of see this, um, this picture of um, the enemies of God kind of, kind of unfold in front of us. So Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So we see a couple of promises that God made. Um, they're actually still true to this day. The first promise we see uh, is that God made Abraham, Abraham is that he will be made a great nation, and that he will be blessed and his name be made great. The second promise that we see is that God said he will bless those who bless him, but for those who dishonor him, God, the God said they will be cursed. I think this shows a few things about God in his heart. Right? The first is that he said before Abraham a pretty big task that required a, a lot of obedience, but the promise is that as he walks out in obedience, that God will walk him and guide him through those things. Another thing that we see is that God never says that it'll be this walk in the park. He kind of promises, hey, you will face um, people that will, that will curse you, that will dishonor you. But once again, we see God say, hey, I will walk you through those things as well. For all of us, he calls us into obedience, understanding that it might not always be the easiest thing. But the promise is that he walks us through those things as well. As we face people that oppose him, maybe we feel this level of persecution because of people that oppose our faith. Um, But there's there's a verse in John 15 that Jesus said that I think ties into this and brings me great comfort. It says in John 15, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it will love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. It's a warning that as we're following Jesus, that we will face enemies, we will face problems, and we'll face things that completely oppose our faith. But Jesus himself said, hey, like, be, be mindful of it. Be aware that's going to happen, that the world is going to hate you. But even hated Jesus, who was a perfect man, who was a son of God. I think as believers and as people that is attempting and uh, trying to, uh, you know, navigate what it looks like to follow Jesus, I think it will come up with those many times where you have that internal conflict of, okay, am I going to am I gonna bow to the things of this world? Am I going to follow the things of this world or do the things that I used to do or stay rooted and uh, fight those temptations? Am I going to stay rooted in God's word? I think that could look a lot like maybe the people around you that try to either pull you away from the faith or make, make, say things to you or, you know, make jokes. Or it might look like people in your life that don't know Jesus, and by their actions, you feel like you're being pulled one way or the other. So once again, my prayer for all of us is that if you are in Christ, that you stay rooted in your identity. um, You get to walk that out and and stay true uh, to what that looks like. And the reason I say that, too, is understanding that um, I'm not saying it's going to be the easiest thing in the world, right? It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. But the, the promise is that God will be there as he navigates you through those things. And for my own life, like I was saying earlier, that all your volunteer leaders were once a high school student. And, you know, like I said, I was as well. And it was until late high school where I came to faith um, and that por- that picture of this internal battle of the world and of following Jesus was right in front of me. And it was this, this huge internal conflict um, in my life. And I wrestled with it for such a long, long time. But as I look back, it came to the point where I'm like, okay, 
am I going to start beginning beginning to actually weigh the cost of what it means to follow Jesus? Or am I going to just say yes to the, the free gift of salvation, but never say yes to Jesus again? Right? I think, I think it's all of us, uh, the reason I say that is for all of us to the understanding is uh, that following Jesus is not just a one-time confession and say, hey, yeah, Jesus is great, and never walk with him again. Uh, but it's giving him a yes every single day as we surrender to him and follow him. It's also understanding, once again, that um, in this life, as you're following Jesus, we have a very real enemy. Right? There might be people that are trying to pull you away from the Lord, but the real enemy, according to God's word, is someone that comes to steal, kill, and destroy everything that God is doing. And according to God's word, it's, the enemy is trying to disrupt our walk with Jesus and does everything possible um, to ruin that. It begins all the way in, the, in, in Genesis where the enemy came in the form of a snake and tempted Adam and Eve. Right? In that temptation, they fell from the garden. They sinned before a holy and just God. So now according to God's word, it says that every single person after that is actually born opposing the throne of God. We're born as enemies to God. That we are deserving of God's wrath unless someone comes in to take that wrath on our behalf. Right? It's because of the, of the sin and the works of the enemy that we experience hardships in this life. That we experience things like death and um, disease. You know, all the things that, of, the, of the darkness. But it goes back to the simple gospel message I think many of us have heard many, many, many times. Right? The person of Jesus, that he came down, lived the perfect life, and he died in the, uh, the death that we deserved on the cross. And once again, I said we've heard that many, many, many times. But I pray um, that that story, uh, that very real story of Jesus coming down, is something that we never just get num- get numb to. That we understand the depth and the reality of what that actually means for each, each every single one of us. That as Jesus came, and as he lived the perfect life, and as he died, he after his after he was raised from the dead, that he now holds the victory over the enemy. And now that we were, we were once powerless, now through Jesus, we have the power to stand firm against the powers of the darkness. And through that newfound freedom in Christ, we get to stand firm in what he did um, for us. As the prayer is that through that, through standing firm in the person of Jesus, we begin to grow this distaste for the things of the world. And through, through standing firm in Jesus, it becomes easier and easier to stand against um, the temptations of the world, the things in the world that try to pull you away from Jesus. I pray that we stay rooted in Christ so we look at those things and have zero desire to come do those things anymore. Like Mordecai, I think once again, we have many opportunities before us time and time again, almost, almost daily, to make those choices of whether you're going to honor God, whether you're going to choose to remain rooted in him or not. And the cool thing about that is we can talk about it here, you know, Sunday nights. We can talk about it from the stage. But the reality is, like, at the end of the day, the choice becomes yours of whether you choose to um, stay, stay rooted in God's word, stay in what Christ has called us to do, or the choice is to fall and to just bow and bend to the things of this world. Right? The choice becomes yours to make. Um, I think I've said this many times, but that is one of my favorite things about high school ministry is that I don't see you guys as little kids that are incapable of making those choices. But the reality is that you guys are old enough to make those hard choices of choosing whether or not, okay, am I going to do these things anymore? Am I going to still stay around those certain people? Am I going to do X, Y, and Z, right? The choice becomes yours. Um, So I pray that you guys are people that can stand firm in what Christ has done and live a life that is um, honoring and glorifying to him. In a, in a little bit, we're going to go to our small group of times. So we have a lot more time to kind of dive into what that looks like. Um, so my prayer uh, my, and my, my encouragement is to also not leave with questions unasked. That as we talk about Jesus, as we talk about uh, the book of Esther, but also just God's word as a whole, if you have questions, like ask. Don't leave uh, with something on your mind that you did not, that you wanted to, um, that you wanted to ask. Uh, the leaders are here for you. We are here for you. Um, so yeah, we love you guys. We love you guys, and we're glad um, that y'all are here. I'm gonna go ahead and pray for us, and we're gonna go ahead and go to our small groups. Uh, Lord, God, once again, I just thank you so much just for this day. God, we just thank you for this time that we've had to just gather to worship you and give you the glory and the praise that only you deserve. God, we just thank you for this time that we have uh, moving forward to go into our small groups and to just dive a little bit deeper into what it means to really follow you and to just. Um, surrender our lives to you god i pray in those times that it might be that it, it may be a time of vulnerability uh, that we can be open with ourselves and be honest with ourselves and to look to you and just really ask what it means to just give it all to you
God, I pray that those times are fruitful and it's sweet. Um, yeah, it's maybe glorifying to you. We just thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.